please welcome Professor Phillips. Well, good morning and uh, everyone and uh, thank you for the very kind introduction. And first of all, I'd just like to thank the organisers for giving me the opportunity to come along and tell you a little about um, uh, the work going on in our group and uh, th with our collaborators. So as you see, this, this is a collaborative project uh, with my university, UTS, uh, the Technical University in Berlin, and also um, researchers at uh, Mahadon University. Uh, okay, so let me just start uh, with a, a general outline of what, what I'm going to tell you. It's a little bit of change of pace from what we, we heard um, earlier this morning, so it's a bit more materials focused. Just, uh, so I, I'm just going to start and tell you a little bit about the properties and applications of nanostructured zinc oxide. And then I'll talk about uh, how uh, the surface can be used to, uh, as uh, sensor uh, materials. I'll tell you about how we fabricate these materials uh, and then how we go about uh, characterizing the optical and electrical properties and then uh, show you some results uh, on what the surface defect structure of this material looks like. Uh, some recent work uh, where we've uh, observed some resonant optical effects and then some uh, very recent results from the Mahadong group uh, on some of the uh, electrical measurement data. And then just finish with one or two conclusions. Okay, so why are we interested in zinc oxide? Well, uh, uh, there's a, a very in, uh, intense amount of research going on at the moment in this material uh, as a semiconductor. It's a direct gap uh, semiconductor with a band gap at room temperature of about 3.38 eV, uh, which basically means it uh, emits light in the ultraviolet and in the visible. And uh, 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 oppositely charged car carriers in this material are bond very strongly. And uh, what this means is, is uh, uh, it uh, emits very strong light even at room temperature. So it has a lot of potential applications in uh, uh, optical devices like light emitting diodes and laser diodes. Um, it's, we'll see, uh, it also has potential application as a high sensitivity chemical and biological sensor. It has a, a number of biological uses because it's biocompatible, non-toxic and biodegradable. It has some mechanical uh, applications as nano actuators because it's a p piezoelectric material and a pyroelectric material. Uh, some recent work we've been doing, as well as many others, is using this material as a bio-label uh, where we uh, include rare earth elements and um, uh, we can then functionalise the surfaces and attach those to, to various uh, uh, parts of the cell. And, uh, but it's very nice, it doesn't show some of the traditional bleaching problems and so on. In the semiconductor field, it's opening the door for a new branch of uh, electronics known as spintronics and it also shows great potential as a photocatalyst. Okay, so in terms of uh, zinc oxide nanowires, uh, these are one-dimensional structures ranging from about one nanometer up to 100 nanometers. Uh, typically, uh, because of these structures, they have a very large surface to, to volume ratio, hence the very large surface area and its uh, application to sensors. Uh, it has very high uh, charge mobility in the material, uh, reduced um, a low heat transport in the material. As we'll see, it's uh, very easy to fabricate. There are simple uh, growth techniques to precisely tailor the dimensions of these materials, uh, particularly its size. Uh, we can then, as I will also see today, we can control the surface properties uh, by after growth and fabrication, treating this in a variety of controlled atmosphere gases. Uh, it also displays some of these resonant optical effects, whispering gallery and cavity modes that we can exploit in uh, specialised sensors. And uh, this last one is about quantum confinement. And this is quite attractive because the, the size of the semiconductor uh, changes the band gap of the material. So as we start to shrink uh, the size of the uh, semiconductor, the zinc oxide, from 10 nanometer, so say if we had a, a, a quantum dot, as we then shrink this down past five, we see that the band gap starts to increase very rapidly as uh, we approach one or two um, uh, nanometers 
due to these quantum confinement effects. So this means we can actually control uh, this band gap very accurately uh, by growth techniques. Uh, it's already been used, uh, or uh, there's a, a lot of literature on the use of zinc oxide nanostructures uh, as a sensor. And uh, if you look through uh, which uh, um, Ms. Surinan's done from Mahadon in a literature review, uh, you can see uh, uh, it's been used as uh, reductive gas sensors, oxidative gas sensors, chemical sensors for a whole range of different um, um, uh, chemicals, uh, biological sensor, and uh, other sensor applications including pH de uh, uh, detection and humidity, UV light, and so on. So it has a very wide uh, range of application uh, as a sensor. So how does this work? Well, uh, there's some uh, debate over this, but uh, I guess there's general agreement that what happens is, is uh, oxygen is surface absorbed onto the material. It then uh, captures electrons from the bulk uh, zinc oxide, which is uh, nearly, well, is nearly always, uh, 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 has an excess of an electrons. Uh, it's nearly always what we call n-type material. It auto n-types on growth. Uh, so, and this is, uh, one of the challenges of zinc oxide is to fabricate p-type uh, zinc oxide, but that's another story. But so, as these electrons are depleted from the surface, we set up a depletion layer, and that because uh, this uh, depletion layer exists over a very thin uh, layer at the surface, a very strong electric field develops, which then bends the band up, the, the various um, electronic bands up, and of particular interest is what happens to these uh, defects in the charge state uh, because as these bands bend up, these charge state bands bend up above the Fermi level uh, which is sort of pinned at the surface. Uh, we get changes in the uh, oxidation state of these defects and this is something that we monitor. So as a sensor, uh, if we then remove that gas surface phase uh, by some sort of chemical reaction at the surface, then the bands go flat and uh, there's measurable changes as this depletion layer disappears in, in the conductivity of the material. Uh, we can have other gases that add electrons, so for example, uh, uh, absorbed hydrogen, and this can cause an electron accumulation, which then bends the bands down in the opposite sense, but it's exactly the same process that uh, when there's a chemical reaction that removes this absorbed hydrogen, we get flat bands again. And there's also now a change in the, uh, in the electrical property. So that's what we're monitoring uh, as a sensor. So how do we grow these? Uh, we use a number of techniques. Uh, one's known as uh, vapor liquid solid technique. And here we put down small uh, nano-sized uh, gold droplets on the surface of the sample. The dimensions of the gold determine the diameter of the wire and also uh, the location. So we can use this to pattern and have wires in specific arrays or points using some sort of nanolithography technique. And uh, also by changing the size, we determine the width or the diameter of the nanowire. So this is a very nice technique. Uh, there's also techniques where we don't have any catalyst and we utilize the fact that uh, the uh, zinc oxide will start to um, uh, form sort of larger crystals initially in growth on different surface planes and then the zinc oxide grows on these larger zinc oxide plates. So these, these are very standard techniques and uh, it's just a very simple technique. I won't go through, there's a lot of parameters here that students do lots and lots of experiments on to, to get this right. Uh, but basically we just reduce uh, the zinc oxide as a source powder. Uh, it's mixed uh, in different ratios with carbon. And then this is heated to high temperature to reduce the zinc oxide. And that reduced gas is then flowed over the substrate. And so the zinc oxide uh, nanowires and rods are growing here. So if we look here, by varying, as I said, by varying the growth conditions, you can get an enormous, an abundance of different structures and density of particles and size of particles. And as I said, it's uh, uh, basically recipes and uh, uh, there's some, um, uh, 
some uh, basic uh, uh, combinations of uh, parameters that we stick with, but these are really uh, unique to our furnace setup and have been devised by just a lot of experiments by the students. So there's these, uh, and these. This is a, a very nice recipe that uh, we can just um, produce these. They just make these nearly every day. Uh, wafers uh, loaded or covered with these zinc oxide um, nanowire arrays. Uh, you see here this is done at reasonably high temperatures uh, and that puts some constraints on some of the applications uh, when we say growing on a semiconductor and we don't want to change the properties of say a, a nitro, a gallium nitride semiconductor and the, the group at Mahadon has developed um, a number of low temperature techniques using hydrothermal approaches. And this means that we can grow these zinc oxide uh, nanostructures uh, at much lower temperatures and then not affect any of the electrical properties of the substrate that we're growing on. So th this is quite a nice technique. And so if we wanted to grow onto polymers or, as I said, uh, onto nitrides and maintain, say, a p-type conductivity, uh, this, is, this is a way to do it. And so this is uh, the Mahadon's group work, and we can see here uh, growing on either silver wires as electrodes or uh, growing on to uh, silicon substrates, uh, we can grow these nanowire structures. And uh, again, th these techniques are quite well known now, and there's quite a, a good level of control over the nanostructure of these, um, of these zinc oxide films. Okay, so how do we go about characterizing these? We use an, a very large number of techniques and uh, we still have questions about some of the, the physics and chemistry of these uh, despite all of these techniques. Uh, so uh, the, the ones I just point out here uh, are, are the photoluminescence and cathodoluminescence which I'll tell you about this morning. Uh, but uh, these also give us great insight. Uh, we, we have access to the Australian synchrotron we can do all these uh, soft X-ray techniques. Uh, I'll show you some work, uh, electrical characterization with IV curves, uh, thermal annealing, plasma treatments, and there's a new technique that we've developed in the lab known as uh, environmental photo yield spectroscopy, which I don't have time to tell you about, but this gives us a, another unique insight into the uh, nature of the uh, gases that are absorbing onto the surface and something that uh, we're exploring at the moment to shed a bit more light on what's happening. Um, this will be a bit more evident a bit later. Okay, so I'll just show you some work we do with cathodoluminescence that gives you sort of a, an idea or a flavor of what we're doing. And um, so in this tech here, technique here, we use a, an energetic electron beam uh, to inject electrons into the sample and that process produces uh, visible light. And then we measure that light as it's emitted and then we can use and collect this uh, light and uh, then do either a spectroscopy analysis or we can form images and I'll show you some of this data. One of the unique things about our system is that we can also inject light. And so from the same region of sample, uh, in addition to cathodoluminescence, we can also do Raman spectroscopy within the microscope without breaking vacuum and also photoluminescence uh, spectroscopy. And we have a, a number of different lasers for different applications. One of the real beauties of us uh, uh, using an electron microscope and a variable electron uh, beam is that we can change the energy of the beam. And as we change the energy of the beam, uh, you can see this volume of interaction starts to rapidly sh shrink up towards the surface. So we can get depth resolved analysis of our sample without actually damaging it at all. So this is non-destructive measurement. Uh, the other thing is, is that we get lots of signal because we're using high energy electron beams uh, that um, and the, bind, the bonding of, uh, of atoms in the sample is of the order of, say, a one, or a one to four electron volts. Uh, we're using beams of the energy of a thousand or more electron volts. So this means one electron produces 1,000 signal, 1,000 charges or carriers in the material. So this leads to very strong uh, signal. So it's very sensitive technique. And one thing we've, we've done is we've built systems like this. This is CL spectral mapping. And so at each picture point here on our image, we collect a full spectrum. 
And once we've done that, we can either then take at any given point a full spectrum out and then collect this data or analyze this data, or alternatively, we can select a, a particular wavelength and then take a whole slice out of the spectral image. So just this, take a whole slice out and then form an image from that particular wavelength. So these data cubes have a lot of data in them. Uh, they're typically hundreds or, uh, depending upon the size, um, uh, tens of uh, megabytes. But it does l allow us to do some very nice statistical analysis on the data sets. Okay, this is a typical spectrum and I, I don't want to go too much into this except to say that uh, the, the community's done a, a very large amount of work and uh, have with confidence assigned a lot of these. So this is in the ultraviolet and we can see a lot of these peaks there. Just, uh, but what's of interest is that a lot of these now have been very confidently assigned to particular uh, elements. So lithium and sodium and hydrogen and aluminium and indium and so on. And so we can then use these to uh, look at the distribution of these elements in the sample with very high sensitivity and then correlate that with the electrical measurements. We can also see what uh, we see nearly in all samples. There's a, what's known as a deep uh, level emission. And this is a, an emission in the visible. And this is highly controversial. Um, and uh, uh, partly because it's made up of, of a number of very broad peaks. And if you don't get your fitting right, it's very difficult. Lots of groups have, have uh, worked on this. And um, because of this, the, the literature really has, a, it's basically polluted with a lot of results that um, uh, give, give you, I think, um, uh, a false uh, uh, interpretation of what's really going on. But as we'll see, what the significance of this is each one of these peaks is carrying a signature emission of, of a particular type of defect that affects the electrical properties at the surface. So, uh, uh, so what we've been able to do through lots of experimental work is to be able to produce emission uh, in these zinc oxide samples uh, that's a single emission. It doesn't, doesn't have uh, a combination of all three or more of these emission peaks. So we can see here, if all are present, we have five in this one big broad peak here, we end up having five emission peaks. And this is a very difficult thing because remember, each peak has three parameters. It's intensity, it's full width half maximum, and it's position. So if you have five peaks, you have 15 parameters to fit to one curve. This is, a, this is an impossible challenge to get a unique uh, fit to the data. So the approach we adopted was where through various heat treatments and various processing, we were able to grow samples that only had one of each of these peaks. And then we now have uh, accurate or reliable peak position and full width half maximum, the width of these peaks. And then when we're fitting multiple curves, broad curves, we're only ever then fitting either three parameters. And so we have much more confidence in the, the data. Uh, again, I'm just showing you this to, to show that this is controversial. These are all the various uh, types of defects that uh, these peaks have been uh, attributed to. Missing oxygen, missing zinc, extra oxygen, um, uh, nitrogen, uh, clusters of all of these various types of uh, 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 impurities and uh, intrinsic uh, point defects. So, as I said, very controversial. But uh, and again, we don't have time, but uh, uh, through a lot of careful measurements and we're, we're pretty confident that, that one of the green peaks is due to missing oxygen atoms, uh, a second one is due to uh, missing zinc atoms, the yellow is due to these uh, lithium impurities, uh, it's, it's used as a stabilizer in growth lithium, so it's always present, uh, as with hydrogen, it's hydrogen's always present, and also with the red, uh, we're confident this is involves something to do with uh, missing zinc atoms. Uh, that's, that's years of work in that one slide, but um, uh, we're, we're reasonably confident. And so this means we can now use that data uh, to uh, interpret our images. So let's look at a, a sort of a standard cathode luminescence image of these wires. And one of the striking features is that when we look at these, we can see that the, uh, the luminescence 
uh, is, is spatially quite different depending upon its wavelength. So over here we're looking at the, uh, the purple luminescence and this is called the band edge, it's intrinsic and we see that this is coming from the very cores of these wires and if we look at that big broad emission that we saw and discussed just previously you can see this is localized on the surface of the wire. So, um, so this, this is one of the real strengths of doing uh, spatially resolved um, spectral analysis. And so, again, some more questions are then asked. What, why five minutes to go? Oh my God. Um, okay, um, I have to jump through here. So I won't do that. But the questions are, what's that due to? And uh, we do this lovely spectral imaging here and uh, we can see uh, these odd things in our spectral data where these cores are joining up. So it tended to suggest that that green luminescence isn't due to that band bending effect that I showed you a little earlier. Um, uh, but then we also did uh, another thing in our system that we can do this spectroscopy both at elevated temperatures and at low temperatures. So these are some data that have been uh, uh, collected as the sample is being heated up and then we can see that this margin, so this is just spectra collected across this part of the nanowire, we can see that this margin starts to disappear and this gave us a clue that this could be due to band bending, c contrary to that data I showed you before and so what we can do in the microscope, uh, we can inject gases into our electron microscope and, s and collect the spectral data and so what we're seeing here is heating up the sample and then we're seeing the luminescence decrease as we expect uh, the physics of this, uh, we just expect this. But normally it would recover fully. But when we do this, this is the intensity of that green luminescence, it doesn't recover fully. So the effect, now that in itself isn't convincing about uh, the nature of this, but if we reintroduce water into the chamber, which we can do in our microscope, we see that this green luminescence immediately jumps back up and then the process can be cycled. And this is very good evidence for band bending. So we think there might be two processes going on here uh, in these uh, nanowires. One, there's certainly surface band bending and two, there are other effects of uh, distribution of defects. Uh, very quickly, um, I don't have time, but this is one of the nice things when we grow these little wires at the right um, dimensions, we can get light to circle around on the outside reflecting off these surfaces and we get these beautiful patterns, the spectra and the spacing is, is, is it confirms um, uh, without any doubt that this is the mechanism, that, that, that these spacings change, uh, you can see there's a, an R term here and the spacing just changes with R. It fits the theory. Uh, when the students showed me this, I, I couldn't believe it. I, I told them to go back and remeasure this. Uh, but it's uh, a, st a st beautiful result. But the, what the point is here that you could utilize this to get light, a light triggered uh, uh, sensor type uh, device and get the light to circle around to increase the sensitivity. Uh, I'm nearly done. Th these are some of the very recent um, uh, work uh, that's done at Mahadon, uh, taking uh, IV curve data from the, these are the zinc oxide nano structure. This is an as grown crystal. We see we get very nice ohmic response here. And then this, this is now exposed uh, to uh, argon, oh sorry, argon, ammonia gas. And you can see how the sensitivity, there's an elect uh, uh, electrical properties change as the ammonia is introduced. So this is the uh, response to that gas, we see a, uh, and then the recovery when that's, uh, the gas is then switched off. Uh, and if we look here, this is one of the samples that have been treated in oxygen, and we see here that there's a, 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 a factor of nearly 100 times increase of the current here. So a very dramatic effect on the electrical properties after these zinc oxide crystals have been um, annealed in oxygen. And this particular sample shows a very strong, this is a very strong red luminescence. And this is what we're trying to understand. How do, what's the connections between the defects at the surface and the way this is reacting with these various gas species as a detector? 
So, and then if we go here to a, s oops, I haven't got that, but if we show here one that's annealed in zinc vapour, and this one here exhibits a very strong green luminescence, so the, the black curve here is as grown, and then here is after it's been annealed in zinc vapour, and this is after it's been annealed in oxygen. So this shows strong green luminescence, strong, uh, sorry, strong red luminescence, and strong green luminescence. So uh, there's still some open questions. It's quite clear that there are effects changing here. But the question is, is uh, after these heat treatments and we produce these, these new defects on the surface, are they changing the way oxygen absorbs onto the surface? That's one possibility. Or two, is it affecting how the ammonia gas is covering the surface? So the, these two options. So we, we need and, and are planning some uh, of these new uh, these techniques we've developed in photo yield spectroscopy to enable to take those measurements to distinguish uh, which one of these is going on. Uh, then we hand some of this over to our, our modelers, our, our theoreticians, and they will then start to do some models where these molecules should bind. Uh, so before, we like to give them some idea what to, because these calculations take up a lot of computer time on a national computer network. So we just want to give them some guidance um, into what to, what to model before um, by giving them some of these experimental results. Okay, so with that, I hope I haven't run too far over time. Uh, I think uh, our feeling is here that uh, nanostructured zinc oxide uh, has excellent potential for a very wide range of sensor applications uh, based on the level of control we can have of the defect structure. Uh, but, but basically to do this, this, this is what, this is the challenge, is to, to understand the defect structure, know exactly what's happening when we do these processing. So this gives us a much greater level of uh, control through this understanding and being able to modify these surfaces to tailor them for very specific targets and target uh, measurements of uh, various gas species. So this is basically these all work hand in hand. It's a bit of a circular process, but uh, I think it's a nice uh, material. One, it's also very cheap uh, compared with some of the other semiconductors. And as I said, that um, it's very easy to fabricate, very low cost fabrication, just some furnaces, some zinc oxide powder and uh, some carbon. So uh, with that, um, I'd just like to finish by um, thanking uh, the Australian Research Council uh, for their financial support. Also, the Royal Golden Jubilee PhD uh, uh, support program that sponsors the PhD student from Mahadon. And uh, with that, thank you for your attention. And I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Professor Phillips. So, does anyone have questions? Thank you for a very nice talk. Uh, I have two questions. One, uh, you, uh, you mentioned about the zinc, zinc oxide and carbon source in some, like, some heating process. Yeah. Could you explain more about uh, the carbon source and uh, how, effect to how, how is the carbon source effect to the zinc oxide structure or something like that? And uh, the second question, uh, I think you mentioned sometimes about the airplane direction of zinc oxide growth, and does, the, does that direction affect to the physical property of the zinc oxide? Thank you. Okay. Oops. There, there were two questions there. So uh, let me just skip back. Uh, so the first was the effect of this ratio, and um, uh, yes, it does have quite a significant effect that if we change that ratio, we can produce uh, materials with different structures. Um, ul uh, ultimately, I don't know. Okay, so these are just changed. This, this is an example here. So this is where there's an equal amount of zinc oxide powder and carbon powder, one to one. Uh, here's where we've used um, one to three, so 25% um, zinc oxide and 75% uh, 
uh, carbon powder, and everything else is identical. And you can see there's quite a dramatic uh, uh, change in the uh, morphology, uh, particularly the, the length of the wires and the shape. And these are all reproducible. So uh, I, I'm not entirely sure ex what exactly this is changing. Um, I guess it's uh, the surface energies and uh, I, I don't know, it's probably quite a complex combination of, of, of effects. But uh, uh, with the recipe, we can, we can use this uh, if we wanted to change the structures. Uh, the second question was the, oh, the growth. Uh, again, um, uh, it depends on the quality of the material. So here, for example, where they're all, see how they're all randomly oriented. Uh, these are grown on uh, silicon and so we lose some of the control over the direction of the wire. So whereas these ones here, uh, these are grown on, on uh, sapphire and um, these have been patterned with gold nano nanodots and when the, um, what tends to happen here in this vapor liquid solid technique, the, um, uh, the zinc from the decomposed zinc oxide gets or um, uh, um, well diffuses into the gold and then supersaturates at this liquid interface here between the gold and it starts to form a zinc oxide rod and we use the A-plane sapphire because it's very nicely matched to the zinc oxide structure the zinc oxide um, uh, the zinc oxide C-plane and so what that does, initially when this starts to grow, it then grows up along the C-axis of the zinc oxide. So w when we use specific, um, sorry, when we use uh, specific sub substrates, this is to get orientation control. So, so we would use, th this of course, growing on sa single sapphire substrates is more expensive than just silicon but it gives us this control of having all of the wires in the one direction, not, not random as here. So that, that's the reason for substrate choice. Um, uh, I have a question about the, uh, about the surface uh, defect. Um, yes. What happened when you anneal uh, the nanowires to, uh, in terms of the surface defect? Oh, do you have any? Yeah, yeah, we, we do. So, um, <coughs> sorry. So, so what basically happens is, uh, in general terms, is if we anneal the sample in oxygen after growth. We produce this emission here. Actually, this will cover it here. Here we go. So if we anneal in oxygen, um, we produce this red luminescence here, which has got something to do with uh, missing zinc atoms at the surface. Uh, conversely, if we anneal in um, zinc vapor or under vacuum, we start to produce these different green luminescence peaks, which are attributed to missing oxygen atoms. So we can then, by changing that gas in the post-growth annealing, we can either produce a surface very rich in missing oxygen atoms or a surface very rich in missing zinc atoms. And this has a dramatic effect, as we saw with those electrical measurements. It seems if there are missing zinc atoms, the surface uh, is much more sensitive to the presence of the ammonia gas, whereas if we've treated it where there are missing oxygen atoms, uh, that the green luminescence, where there's strong green luminescence, that the, there's strong quenching of its sensitivity or the, the current that, um, uh, or in the current in the IV curve. So there's a very dramatic effect. Uh, it's now putting that together to understand what's happening physically uh, with, and the interaction of these defects. These are charged defects so that they will attract carriers or electrons. Mm. Uh, uh, so. Uh, it's just now getting a nice consistent story mm -hmm. uh, to explain to explain the results. Yeah, how, 
how does that, uh, I mean, how, how this result varies with the different um, samples with different morphology? Does it uh, change much when you, ha when you have nanowires of different diameters? Uh, we, I know what I'd expect to see, but we haven't done a very uh, consistent set of measurements on that. Mm -hmm. Uh, at the moment, we're sort of focusing on understanding what's going on, mm -hmm. and then once we know precisely or have a good idea of what, what's physically happening, then we'll go back and start to do a whole set of systematic measurements. Mm -hmm. uh, because we have all these samples, so right. all the samples are there. Uh, and uh, one of the nice things about working with semiconductors rather than biological samples is that we can just put them under vacuum and come back a year later and, and uh, away we go without any trouble at all, so. Yeah, uh, I'm not entirely familiar with the whole um, semiconductor uh, nanoparticles or uh, materials, um, and, but I wonder if uh, all these um, surface properties or sensing um, occurs in other um, material system like maybe titanium dioxide or is this a uh, very yeah. unique thing with the, what's yeah, unique about zinc oxide basically, that's the question. Okay. Uh, well, the unique things of about well, first question, first answer, the first question. That the those those effects of band bending at the surface and absorption of either gases that take electrons or give electrons to the surface. That's universal. So uh, these are exactly the same effects what you would see in a titanium dioxide sample. Uh, the differences are uh, is the electronic band structures. So things like we just discussed here, um, things like uh, the binding energies, the band gap, th they're quite different. And so uh, this is known as band gap engineering and, and uh, y you can utilize this. So uh, both, um, so for example, titanium dioxide has nice applications because of its energy structure for water splitting. We would have to modify the zinc oxide, not impossible, uh, but it's one, one of the potential applications is to uh, use it for a water splitter, but uh, in its in, in its as as uh, its intrinsic form, uh, we would have to modify it. So, and things like this, some of the electrical properties and so on, are different. But in terms of uh, this process, it's identical. Thank you. Thanks. All right. Um, if anyone still has questions for Professor Phillips, you can do uh, during the lunch time. Okay. So we need to move on. So please thank our speaker again. Thank you.